Hello, my name is Kent Messer, and I'm happy to talk today about the new CAST paper entitled Process Labeling of Food, Consumer Behavior, the Agricultural Sector, and Policy Recommendations. This CAST paper comes from hard work by excellent people, and I want to thank uh, Shauna, Marco, and Harry as co-authors and reviewers of John, Jill, Bailey, and Tom for their excellent work that pulled this paper together and appreciate the cast liaison Mark Armfeld for all of his support. Likewise, I want to acknowledge the uh, helpful contributions of CAST and people at the University of Delaware, along with funding support from the National Science Foundation and the Center for Behavioral and Experimental Agroenvironmental Research. Uh, these organizations help provide uh, support for some of the research that's profiled in the CAST paper. Today I'd like to talk about process labeling for food and the willingness of consumers to accept technology in light of these processes. This is the task that I was given by CAST to write an issue paper on. So I'm going to review academic literature on consumer behavior, look at the legal background of food labeling, and finally offer policy recommendations on how to move forward on this important issue. Food is very intimate to our lives. We often were raised with phrases like, you are what you eat, and that shows that intimate connection between a food person's food choices, their health, and even personal identity. And yet, consumers rarely know where their food's coming from or exactly how it's raised, and so therefore, people's knowledge about who they are is sort of beyond their control. If we can't directly observe the production processes of food, it is difficult for consumers to align their preferences to their food choices. As economists, we think of this situation as an asymmetric information setting. And these situations are ripe for mistrust, not only in agriculture, but in other settings such as repairs and for a car, where the mechanic knows much more about cars, the cost of repairs, than the average car owner. These situations are difficult for uh, information to bridge the gap so that producers and consumers feel comfortable. Because consumers want information about their food and marketers are aware of this and they're willing to provide information often through labeling to for consumers to, to read and make decisions about. And increasingly consumers not only care about their food, but they also care about how it was raised, the ethical, social, and environmental consequences of this production. In light of these concerns, marketers have come up with a variety of different labels, whether it's about organic or GMOs, about impact on rainforests or animals. We see a lot of different labels now in the marketplace. And yet it's important to recognize that these labels are nothing that completely new and novel. In fact, they've got a long history. We've seen process labels arriving from kosher or halal. Again, the idea is what is the process by which brings this food to the marketplace? And we can see lots of different ones out there. In fact, we can kind of separate them a little bit between single practices and sets of practices. Again, looking at you know, whether a food meets these criteria or not. Note that our paper is not about the labeling of ingredients, calories, or nutritional content. Uh, those are about the composition of the food and not about the process. What we're really focusing in here is how was the food raised. In much case, the composition of the food um, can be produced in many different ways, uh, but the composition is pretty much the same. So we're talking about process labeling. If we look at the legal history and framework of process labels, we often see an inherent tension between a consumer's right to know and advocates on that side, and other people say, well, what do consumers need to know? What's pragmatic, business-oriented, or science-based? And so this tension has uh, played out in several different um, arenas over time. We know that there's been regulations to um, look at labeling of RBST with milk, and five states, Indiana, Kansas, Missouri, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, uh, putting in some re uh, re legislation on that front. But it's even increased more with the issue around genetically modified organisms, genetically engineered organisms. And 26 states have uh, looked at um, legislation on that front, including 
Uh, Vermont, which in 2014 required manufacturers to label it if it contained GMOs. For more issues about GMOs, I encourage people to look at CAS issue paper 54 that really specifically looks at the mandatory labeling with regards to GMOs. We see lots of different federal legislation and state laws requiring labeling for food products. Lots of examples here, and in general they're designed to inform consumers about what they're pur purchasing, prevent consumer deceptions, and allow these consumers to make choices about what they want and what's a good value for them. So it's information in large part, and ultimately help provide, um, provide protection from injury of the public health due to misbranded uh, foods or, or other issues. There are many benefits of labeling because ultimately labeling helps bridge the gap in this asymmetric information setting where producers and consumers can communicate about quality and other criteria that people care for. And so there can be some real nice benefits of it. And under proper third party or governmental oversight, it can accomplish several things. It can, again, build this bridge of information. It can satisfy consumers' demand for uh, more stringent quality standards so that they get to know when they're buying their food. And this creates value for consumers in terms of the products that they're buying and producers. It allows them to have some niche markets that they can um, seek out and uh, take advantage of. And it can also help remove ingredients from food that has been shown to be uh, scientifically proven to be harmful. For example, voluntary uh, labeling around trans fats meant that most foods uh, companies decided not to have trans fats at all when there was uh, labeling out there because they did not want to see to have any labeling. So those, when, they, when they were forced to do labeling of trans fats and scientific, science had shown that this was uh, damaging, they chose to re-engineer their products. While there are certainly benefits of labeling, there are challenges as well, in part arising from the multitude of choices that the modern consumer faces in a marketplace. For example, this picture here shows the thousands of choices that a consumer has to make upon choices on price or quantity, um, taste, lots of different dimensions here. Now you're adding in another dimension in an already crowded world, which is the process that it was laid, that, that it's coming from. So it's probably not surprising that people in this uh, decision space do at times make uh, misinterpretations of what this thing is. Uh, organic food, for example, um, is something that people have a hard time verifying. Is it actually making you healthier? Uh, science has not provided a lot of evidence uh, in this regard, and yet we find um, consumers often having strong f uh, feelings that if buying organic food is definitely leading to a, a better health outcome. And again, that's something that's a, you know, difficult or a credence characteristic that's hard to, um, to identify and prove. Uh, sometimes it can be even worse than just uh, not knowing what you're getting. Sometimes you can do exactly what you're hoping to avoid. Take example of low food miles. Right? So we like local foods. We're thinking that we're reducing energy consumption and maybe greenhouse gases. Uh, positive things, but one can easily imagine situations such as tomatoes um, grown up north where you're having to do it in energy intensive uh, greenhouses, and those uh, are requiring energy throughout the production cycle, while other places could, they could be grown in a situation without having to go in greenhouses, and yes, there's maybe more transportation costs to get them from their final moment of uh, being picked to the consumer, but that's a relatively um, you know, small use of energy compared to having energy throughout their entire lifespan. So consumers may end up paying more for this label, um, low food miles, and actually end up getting the opposite environmental impact that they want. Other things like the natural label can be very uh, misleading, um, especially because there's no formal FDA policy about what that term means. And so consumers are putting in um, their own interpretation or being led by marketers for example, we know that um, you know, roughly two-thirds of consumers, when asked, uh, thought that natural meant no genetically modified organisms or, or pesticides. Um, that's not how the definition is, and yet without um, 
clarification or uh, that it makes it very easy for consumers to misidentify and this doesn't give us the benefits that we were looking for. This again leads to confusion in the market. Another challenge of process labeling is how they can stigmatize other products. We give this uh, example by Mohs about hormones um, and you know with a, with a bit of a laugh, a chuckle about giving beards on children. Um, but you know these aren't uh, unique examples and we, we do si see situations in which there's no scientific evidence that this food produced in the conventional manner causes harm and yet when you start labeling things um, you, you may uh, cast those products in a negative light um, and, and that can be uh, definitely challenging and something in a way that uh, hurts one product share uh, based on uh, accusations that are not scientifically shown to be accurate. Another challenge of labeling is that they do feed this general reluctance of consumers to accept new food technologies, right? Aversion to new foods is uh, pretty ingrained in human instincts. And as we add in science and technology, especially those that are unknown, have uh, fancy scientific names, uh, we should not be surprised that it can induce a negative instinctive reaction. Uh, for example, um, Castanegro and Lust looked at a situation where they were talking about fruit that was ethylene ripened. And they found that consumers saw that ethylene ripened label as something just as bad as having something that was genetically engineered. And yet, that's just a different way of saying that it's a, a process that's actually a naturally occurring hormone and things like bananas that if you let them be around other fruit, they ripen uh, quicker. To, and that's something that people have been doing for a long time and it's a natural process, but again, it shows our inherent uh, desire to, to be cautious and, uh, and perhaps be turned off by scientific names. And so if we keep in mind that the media tends to focus in on negative issues and the research shows that consumers tend to weight bad news more heavily than good news, this can lead to a situation where um, people are avoiding uh, food that's using new science and technology all the time. And we can look at this in the case of irradiation, right? Lots of studies have shown that irradiation is actually uh, no harm to human health, maybe improves uh, food safety in many cases. And there's no scientific evidence that this is problematic. It's been approved in a lot of different situations, allowed a, uh, the Rodora label, and yet a very little acceptance of this at the uh, retail level for food. So what happens with these negative consequences is one is it can increase food prices. And that can be through um, needing to develop different food process uh, systems. And we also see that uh, companies may be less interested in supporting new science and technologies in food because they're unsure about the long-term investment return. Uh, will consumers uh, reject this technology and therefore they'll never be able to get their um, investments paid back, uh, this will likely lead to consequences that are um, bad for the poor in the United States and the rest of the world. So you've got either increased food prices or less uh, growth in science and technology. And it's important to keep in mind that science and technology in agriculture has been critical to feeding an extra six billion people who now live on this earth that didn't exist, you know, that, that, that more than existed 165 years ago. So not only have we added six billion people, but the percentage of those people living with inadequate food supplies has actually declined without having lots of new food, uh, new areas for um, cultivation. So we're not using much more land, but we're certainly getting more food from that. And that's because of science and technology. And not only are we getting more food, but it actually costs less. We spend less of our income up as a percentage uh, for food than back uh, over 100 years ago. So again, lots of good stories here that have come through food. And we should so what do we think in terms of recommendations? And again, I advise people to read the, the paper. One is mandatory labels should only occur in situations in which the product has been scientifically demonstrated to harm human health. And in most cases, such as GMOs, that's not the case right now. Science has not said that this is damaging human health. Therefore, mandatory labeling doesn't make sense. I can recommend that governments should avoid imposing bans on the process labeling. This was tried with RBST and, and milk, and it actually led to a significant backlash. It ultimately undermines the consumer's trust in the agricultural sector, and the, the courts have struck down this as well.
third recommendation is that if you're going to use voluntary labeling, there needs to be some conditions that require using false implications related to competing products. The labels should be true and uh, scientifically verifiable. And if you're going to use claims like contains or free of a certain production process, then these labels need to include an additional label on the package talking about the current consensus regarding the importance of this attribute. This way, consumers still get information that they may be interested in and yet also find out more broadly about how important that attribute is and what's the scientific knowledge. So from these three uh, policies, we also have one recommendation for uh, both producers and policymakers to think about, and that they need to be more imaginative about uh, process labeling. Using smartphones and quick response codes could provide consumers with a lot more information about food. Also, we need to move away from all or nothing labels, something as labeled as bird friendly at coffee or not bird friendly. Well, there's other ways of doing it. Uh, LEED has been doing this with regards to uh, building codes where you would have different levels of, of environmental quality, maybe a gold or a platinum. And this could be used for food. If it has water quality benefits, you could have a bronze, silver, or gold level uh, to indicate more of the science behind labeling and communicate it in a simple way, but provides it more effectively to consumers. So thank you for your time and attention today. I encourage people to read the details in the full report. And again, this is Kent Messer, and I thank you for your interest in this topic.